to welcome you to the Basketball Institute's lecture uh, with Reza Aslan, uh, Howard C. Baskerville, the story of Howard C. Baskerville, the American Lafayette of Iran. Uh, as many of you know, Basketball Institute is a nonprofit institute in Salt Lake City. It is named after Howard Baskerville. And we formed the institute several years ago in order to bring a better understanding of US-Iran relations before the revolution and how that history of friendship can impact our relations today. Uh, so we are very pleased to have Reza as our final speaker for this year's lecture series, especially in April, the anniversary of uh, Howard C. Baskerville's martyrdom. I believe he was killed 112 years ago this month in Iran. So uh, with before we get into introducing Reza, uh, our publication director, Matthew Shannon, has been with us from the beginning, and he helps us with a lecture, with the publications, and also with the projects. Matt is a scholar of Iranian American history. His book on international education and US-Iran relation was published by Cornell Press, and he's got another book coming on Iranian American dialogue that traces back the relationship all the way to 1900. So uh, Matt will do the introduction of Reza and Delara is our assistant for the questions. Please send all your questions to the chat room and the question and answer. We have a very large audience today. We would like to get as many questions as possible. And Reza Aslan has mentioned to me that he would like to have the audience engage in this discussion too. So please send the questions. We will... Uh, bring it to his attention. I wanna thank all the students and faculty from different universities who have joined us. There's a large group of students from Emory and Henry College in Virginia, students from BYU, Utah State, and other universities have joined us and we would like to welcome them. So Matt, go ahead and you can start the introduction of the lecture. Thank you. And uh, we're just so pleased to have Rex Aslan here with us today as our speaker. Um, as I'm sure everybody who is attending knows, he is an internationally renowned writer, commentator, professor, producer, scholar of religions, and many other things. It's somewhat intimidating to give this introduction, uh, but some highlights of Aslan's from the page and the screen uh, include Zealot, the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth, which is a number one, time, uh, number one New York Times bestseller. Aslan's first book, No God But God, The Origins, Evolution and Future of Islam, is an international bestseller and was named one of the 100 most important books of the last decade by Blackwell Publishers. He is also the author of Beyond Fundamentalism, as well as editor of at least two additional volumes, Tablet and Pen, and Muslims and Jews in America. His books have been translated into dozens of languages around the world, and he is the recipient of the prestigious Jane de Joyce Award, among others. In addition to his prolific writing, uh, Reza Aslan was a consulting producer on the acclaimed HBO series The Leftovers, uh, and also the hit CBS comedy um, United States of Al, which I've heard uh, so much about um, uh, lately, so much good buzz. Um, Aslan is also the host and executive producer of two other original television programs, Rough Draft uh, and Believer. Uh, the latter uh, was with CNN. He also served as executive producer on the ABC drama of Kings and Prophets and on the Emmy nominated documentary series, The Secret Life of Muslims. Finally, in 2006, Aslan co-founded Boom Gen Studios, which is the premier entertainment brand for creative content from and about the Middle East. Um, check it out. Um, so with that, it's very exciting to have a lecture today that is uh, less Baskervillian <laughs> than some of the previous lectures, but actually about Howard Baskerville. Uh, so with that, uh, Ressa Aslan, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate that wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, everyone at the Baskerville Institute for hosting this lecture and for their commitment to strengthen the bonds of friendship between the US and Iran. I'm grateful for the chance 
to share just a little bit of my research uh, into the life and death of Howard Baskerville. As many of you may know, I'm um, almost done with my uh, biography of him, the first English language biography ever written of Howard Baskerville, which is insane uh, when you really think about who this man was and, and the life that he lived and the influence that he has had. Um, and I'm hoping that hopefully this book will change um, some of that and, and allow people all over the world to know who this young man was. Um, I wanted to just begin by saying that in honor of uh, this occasion of this lecture, I am actually wearing, I'll, I'll have to stand up here to make sure everyone can see it. I'm wearing the Baskerville family crest. This is the Baskerville family crest here. Um, we actually found this crest in a small town in France named Dive Sumer. Um, this is a, a little town. It sits on the mouth of a river by the same name. And, and the town is famous because this is where William the Conqueror assembled his fleet as he uh, prepared to conquer England in 1066, a year that lives in infamy for uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and her short-lived Anglo-Saxon caucus. Excuse me for the, the inside joke for those of you who are joining us uh, outside of America and who are unfamiliar with the current insane nature of our politics. Um, there is an old tavern at the site uh, of that landing in Div Sumer. It's still there today. You can go and, and visit it. The, taverns, the tavern is called uh, Le Hostelier Guillaume Le Conquerant. And you'll have to please pardon my French, like literally pardon my French. Uh, when you go inside this tavern, uh, above an open courtyard, where there's these carved rafters and sculptured reliefs, you'll see this large mural containing the names and the coats of arms of the French knights who conquered England alongside William. And among them is the name Baskerville. It's next to a white shield, looks like this, and it's emblazoned with a thin red banner and three blue circles, looks just like this. This shirt, I should say, was a, a gift from my absolutely brilliant and indispensable research partner, Essan Siapush, um, without whom I could never have written this book. Uh, I wanted to talk about this coat of arms first uh, before we begin talking about Howard Baskerville's life and death. The, the coat of arms actually belonged to Howard's ancestor, Martel de Baskerville. He sailed to England alongside William the Conqueror um, at the head of that 700 ship invasion fleet that launched from Normandy. Martel bled with William as they broke through the English lines at the Battle of Hastings. He marched with William to London, burning everything that he saw along the way. And he was there at Westminster Abbey when William was crowned king on Christmas day. And for his help in seizing the English crown, the nobleman born in a small village in the parish of Baskerville, it's now known as Bacville, in northern France, was rewarded with lands and titles and most valuable of all with legacy. John Burke in his Landed Gentry, which was published like a century and a half after William's invasion, wrote that, quote, the family of Baskerville is one of the most ancient and honorable in England. It has ever maintained the highest rank among the gentry, and it could boast of the blood of the Plantagenets. This is the, the royal house uh, that was descended from Henry II. And that's right, so Howard Baskerville is a descendant of Henry II. Now the British line of Baskervilles remained more or less unbroken until 1662, when a 25 year old man by the name of John Baskerville left England for the colonies. He settled in uh, York County, where um, this is like on the opposite coast of the peninsula from Jamestown, the famous you know, colony of Jamestown. And he served as a court clerk, the court clerk there, a very prominent court clerk. Actually, quite a lot has been written <laughs> about this John Baskerville and, and the kind of court clerk that he was. Um, until his untimely death in 1679. Now, it was precisely 245 years after John left England for America, Howard left America for England, the first stage in a 
10,000 mile journey by train, by carriage, by caravan, by saddle from his home in South Dakota to the city of Tabriz, in the Northwest of what was then known as Persia. The country would not be known officially until Iran, uh, officially as Iran until 1935. The year was 1907. Baskerville was 22 years old. He was a Christian missionary. He'd come to Tabriz to teach English and to preach the gospel. He arrived in the middle of a revolution, what history has now referred to as the Constitutional Revolution of 1905 to 1911. Mm. It was a revolution that was instigated by a broad coalition of merchants and mullahs in the middle class the purpose of which was to create a parliament and a constitution in Persia. After spending a year and a half in Tabriz, Baskerville ended up abandoning his position as a teacher and as a missionary. He renounced his American citizenship. He reorganized his students into a militia, and then he began to fight alongside them against the Shah, and he died a martyr in the cause of freedom in democracy. He was 24 years old. Now, I say this because that's truly the extent of what is widely known about Howard Baskerville. There's so much about his life that we don't know. For instance, as far as I know, I'm literally the first person ever to connect him to Martel's or to trace his lineage from John. That's because there has been so little written about his life. For me, writing his biography, as I say, the first in the English language, has felt kind of like writing a mystery novel. We don't know a lot about how Howard Baskerville lived, but the one thing we know for sure is how he died. He was shot through the heart in a bombed out garden in a besieged city while leading a militia made up of the very same students that he'd been sent to Tabriz to teach and should the opportunity arise to bring to Christ. I say this because what I wanna emphasize for our conversation today is that what happened to Howard Baskerville in Tabriz is not a mystery. The mystery is why it happened. Why did this young man abandon everything, his family, his friends, his mission, his citizenship, to give his life for a country that wasn't his, a people he barely knew, a cause he only reluctantly adopted. Now, to answer that question, I think, requires more than just mere historical analysis. There is, as I said, very lit little written about the young man. His story has in large part been lost to history, his self-sacrifice deliberately buried beneath decades of anger and animosity between the United States and Iran. When I wrote my biography of Jesus of Nazareth, I noted that the task was somewhat akin to putting together a massive puzzle, but with only a few of the pieces in hand. So one has no choice but to fill in the rest of the puzzle based on the best, most educated guess of what the complete image is supposed to look like. And I think the same thing applies to Howard Baskerville, certainly when it comes to this question, the question of why he did what he did. And what's funny is that the people who knew Howard Baskerville, who knew him in Tabriz, who was there, who were there when he actually died, were apparently just as baffled by his decision to join the constitutional revolution as we are 112 years later. William Doty, who was the American consul in Tabriz at the time, uh, said that Baskerville sacrificed himself to protect his fellow Americans. He writes, quote, however mistaken in his judgment, he undoubtedly acted from a desire to defend the Americans in Tabriz against the besieging troops of the Shah. He wrote this in a State Department memo to Washington trying to explain what had happened. Annie Wilson, uh, who was the, the wife of the Reverend Samuel Graham Wilson, who was the founder of the American Memorial School, that's the school that um, uh, Howard had been sort of, you know, 
officially stationed where he taught, he arg she argued that Howard's principal concern was the fate of the Christians associated with the school and the mission. In other words, that he, he joined the fight against the Shah's for forces specifically to keep the Christians in Tabriz safe. The Reverend William Shedd, who was a member of the Presbyterian Foreign Missions Board, this was the board that sent Baskerville to Tabriz in the first place, believed that his reasons were personal, that he was deeply affected by the death of his friend, um, Hassan Sharif Zadeh. Sharif Zadeh is a legend in his own world. I mean, this was a, a 27 year old scholar, um, a, a fellow teacher at the Memorial School, um, a wildly popular orator and, and one of the leaders of the constitutional revolution in Tabriz and someone with whom Baskerville almost immediately struck um, the defining friendship of his short but meaningful life. Um, in fact, their relationship, uh, the relationship between Howard Baskerville and Hassan Sharif Zadeh is a, is a very beautiful and very important relationship, had a lot to do with Baskerville's political awakening in Tabriz. But the point is, is that uh, according to Reverend Shedd, it was the murder of Sharif Zadeh that spurred Baskerville to join the revolution. So in other words, his motivation was grief or revenge, personal stuff, in other words. Now, the thing that I think I find <laughs> most interesting in these various explanations that all of these people, you know, are trying to figure out, you know, what was the motivation for Baskerville's actions, is that usually the explanations uh, come despite his status as an American and a Christian. So in other words, it's like, why would Baskerville have given his life for the revolution in Iran? Well, here are some reasons why he would have done that despite his status as an American and as a Christian. And rarely does anyone actually cite the most obvious motivation for Baskerville's decision to give his life for the constitutional cause in Persia, namely because he was an American and a Christian. What my research has demonstrated, I think beyond a shadow of a doubt, and this is kind of the, the, the bulk of what I wanna talk about um, today, is that it was these two factors, his belief in American democracy and his unwavering faith in Jesus Christ. It was those two things that led him to give up his citizenship and his position in the church in order to pick up a gun and fight in another country's civil war. Howard Conklin Baskerville was born in North Platte, Nebraska on April 13th, 1885. He was the son and grandson of Presbyterian, Presbyterian preachers. He had an uncle who was also a Presbyterian preacher. In 1901, his family moved to the Black Hills and Badlands of South Dakota, and that's pretty much where he spent his formative years. Like his father, who was a peripatetic preacher who basically just, one of these guys who just collected degrees, uh, including a JD and a PhD, Howard Baskerville was a bookish young man. He had an insatiable thirst for knowledge, and he also had an extraordinary talent for picking up languages. By the time he had graduated from high school, he was fluent in Latin, Greek, and German. But unlike his father and his grandfather and his uncle, Baskerville, oh, and by the way, I should mention, and one of his brothers, a lot of Presbyterian preachers in this family, um, Baskerville never really seemed to have expressed all that much enthusiasm about the idea of becoming just a country pastor. His dream was to spread the word of Christ to all peoples and all nations. And in fact, for several years before he left for college, he'd entertained the notion of becoming a Christian missionary with more or less definitiveness, he writes in his application to the Presbyterian Board of Foreign Missions. In preparation for that life, he'd taken uh, a number of mission study courses through his church. 
um, and he served as president of the local chapter of the Young People's Society of Christian Endeavor. This was a, an evangelical organization. I don't think it exists anymore, but at the time it had like three and a half million members in countries as far afield as China and Australia. He was even put in charge of his own mission field by the Black Hills Presbytery during which he claimed to have, quote, spoken with a number of persons about this Christian life, though with what success, uh, I guess he was just too modest to say in his uh, missionary application. Howard entered Princeton University in 1903 to get a degree in Christian ministry, following again in the footsteps of his father. But while he was there uh, at Princeton, he immediately fell into the orbit of Princeton's president and one of the most popular professors at the school, Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, of course, who would become uh, the 28th president of the United States. Wilson and Baskerville, uh, who were both preacher sons, who were both compelled to follow suit, uh, got along swimmingly together. They, they both had deep Southern roots, Howard's great-great-grandfather, John Coleman, owned a sprawling plantation with a large number of slaves. His grandfather, William Baskerville, was a member of the Confederate Congress from Virginia. And his great-uncle, George Baskerville Douglas, was a surgeon for the Confederate Army who fought alongside the Georgia regulars at Bull Run. He actually ended up being captured uh, by Union forces on Eastern, Easter Sunday in uh, 1865, and then he was paroled soon after the war's end. Of course, unlike Howard Baskerville, Woodrow Wilson was uh, an unrepentant racist and a fervent supporter of the Confederate ca cause, even in 1903. Um, Wilson's father was a slaveholder. His family fully identified with the Confederacy. Woodrow Wilson idolized Robert E. Lee. He repeatedly lavished praise on the KKK. I say all this because you really can't say the name Woodrow Wilson without also talking about the fact that he was a despicable racist who made anti-Black racism uh, a pivotal part of his domestic policy not just while he was president of Princeton, he wouldn't allow any black students to enter Princeton, even though all the other Ivy League schools had opened the door to Princeton graduates. He said it would be quote, embarrassing for them as well as for Princeton, uh, but also as president where he essentially um, got rid of the entire black workforce in DC when he was president. So despite the fact that Howard and Woodrow had similar backgrounds and histories in the Confederacy, um, Howard it by no means shared Woodrow Wilson's intense, uh, unrepentant racism, but that's another story. Uh, look, Woodrow Wilson did a lot of good at Princeton. He did a lot of good as president. He did a lot of good at Princeton though. Um, while he was there, he um, instituted a, a number of uh, reforms, uh, including instituting what is sometimes referred to as the Oxford style mentoring program for which Princeton is, is famous for. Princeton calls it the, um, the preceptorial system. And this was the, the, the process whereby Princeton students were shepherded out of the sort of big high ceilinged you know, lecture halls and put into these more intimate settings in order to receive personal one-on-one -on -one instruction from their um, chosen professor. This was Woodrow Wilson's um, invention, which has now been adopted by numerous universities throughout the United States. So during his junior year, um, Howard Baskerville took advantage of this new system uh, in order to be personally mentored by Woodrow Wilson. And despite the fact that he was technically there to study Christian ministry, he ended up enrolling in two courses taught by Wilson himself, one in jurisprudence and the other in constitutional government. Now, it's not difficult to imagine why Baskerville would have chosen Wilson as his mentor. Not only were the two men aligned in interest in temperament and background, they were both devout Presbyterians. In fact, Wilson's piety and the role of religion in shaping his political views are too often neglected in his biography. He once wrote, quote, my life would not be worth living if it were not for the driving power of religion. 
Indeed, it was Wilson's faith in God, his fealty to the Presbyterian Church, and his unshakable confidence in the certainty of Christian ethics that underlay most of the political assumptions that drove him to pursue a role in government. In fact, I'd say it's no exaggeration to say that Woodrow Wilson's entire foreign policy idealism was a direct result of his Christian faith. He once wrote, quote, if I did not believe that the moral judgment would be the last and final judgment in the minds of men, as well as at the tribunal of God, I could not believe in popular government. See, the primary purpose of religion, as far as Wilson was concerned, was to draw the believer toward public service. Politics was not like a, a civic duty, it was a religious obligation. Political involvement was all about translating principle into social action. And because for Wilson, the principles that strengthened and sustained American democracy were derived not from men, but from God, Individual salvation is national salvation, he'd love to say. He, that was like his favorite quote. Individual salvation is national salvation. And so they could not be, you know, in any way sort of reserved solely for Americans, right? That these principles of democracy and popular sovereignty and, and the rights of all people and equality, these were principles that were divinely inspired. And so they apply to all peoples in all parts of the world, regardless of creed or culture or nationality. They, they had to be planted in the native soils of Europe and Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. And who better to do the planting than the pious Princeton graduate whom Wilson had spent the entirety of his educational career carefully cultivating. He once wrote, quote, it is noteworthy how often God-fearing men have been forward in those revolutions which have vindicated rights. And then in case anyone at Princeton like Howard would have missed the point, he adds, revolution is not to be distinguished from duty at Princeton. Revolution is not to be distinguished from duty at Princeton. I mean, you can imagine how all of this would have made Woodrow Wilson absolutely irresistible to a impressionable, devout young man like Howard Baskerville. The fusing of politics and piety, the, the belief that our obligations to each other are indistinguishable from our obligations to God, that popular sovereignty is a divine mandate over all lands at all times. These ideas would have ignited Baskerville's passion and they ultimately would set him on a course that I think he scarcely could have envisioned at the time. I bring up all of this background because too often Howard Baskerville is treated like some, you know, naive 22 year old kid who didn't fully realize the political situation that he had stepped into in Persia. And then, you know, who quickly got in way over his head. He joined the revolution uh, to save Americans or to save Christians or because of his personal grief over the Hassan's death or whatever. But he didn't join the revolution because he truly understood the cause. He truly understood what was going on in Persia. It was other reasons why he did so. That's absurd. <laughs> I mean, Baskerville understood exactly what was going on in Persia and exactly what was at stake. I mean, this was after all, someone who had taken an entire course called constitutional government at Princeton, a course taught by a professor whose entire guiding principle was that democracy was the God-given right, quote, of every awakened people that wishes and intends to govern and control its own affairs. A professor who personally recommended Howard for the missionary position in Tabriz. So what I'm suggesting here is that Baskerville's decision to fight in another country's civil war was the inevitable result of his belief in the universal application of American democracy. As he told the American consul William Doty when Doty came to him and tried to dissuade him from joining uh, the revolution. 
Baskerville replied, quote, since I am dedicated to the cause of freedom and have witnessed the struggle of the people of Tabriz, I have decided to help them. So let me just say this as plainly as I possibly can. Howard Baskerville joined the Persian Revolution not despite his status as an American, but because of it, because he believed with all his heart, as he'd been taught by his mentor at Princeton, that freedom and democracy were inalienable rights afforded to all peoples at all times. And it didn't matter if you were Persian or American or Christian or Muslim, whether you were you know, uh, Middle Eastern or Western, it didn't matter. Democracy, self-determination, popular sovereignty, these rights applied to everyone. The second reason why Baskerville ended up taking up arms, the first reason was because he was an American and he thought this is what it means to be an American. The second reason why he did so, why he took up arms and joined the Persian Revolution is because he believed it was the Christian thing to do. Now. This is obviously a controversial thing to say, I get it. In fact, it's so controversial that Baskerville's role as a missionary in Tabriz has all but been erased in contemporary conversations about him. Some modern commentators suggest that he wasn't even really a missionary, that you know, he had come to Persia solely to teach. In fact, in, in just you know, the few words um, that have been written about him by non-Persians, he's almost always referred to as a teacher and not what he actually was, a missionary. That view, of course, runs counter to what Baskerville himself confessed in his missionary application, asked by the Foreign Mission Board if he would commit to making the leading of souls to Christ the chief duty of his work in Persia, quote, no matter what other duties may be assigned to you, Baskerville responded, I do. It's, I think, important to understand that there was no difference between teacher and missionary at the American Memorial School in Tabriz certainly not when it came to the foreigners who were assigned there. The primary purpose of the school was unambiguously the evangelization of Persia's population. On this point, the records of the Presbyterian Foreign Missions Board can't be clearer. The goal of missionary education is to, quote, lay the bait with which we attract the Muslims, the Muslims. During his time in Tabriz, Howard Baskerville made every effort expected of him in performing his missionary obligations. He was a devout Christian. He never missed a Sunday service. In fact, he gave uh, a handful of the Sunday services himself. He always had a Bible on his desk. He shared his faith openly, both with his students and with the wider community in Tabriz, which is exactly what was expected of him. Annie writes this about him. He write, she writes, quote, he always tried to have religious conversations with his students and would tell us what a good talk he had with this one or that one. Now, in some ways, the city of Tabriz was the ideal city for missionary work. This is a city that sat at the crossroads of Europe and Asia. It was connected to Russia and the Ottoman Empire by um, rail and land routes. It had easy access to the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. Tabriz has historically been the most populous and prosperous city in all of Persia. It's a place of dynamic cultural exchange ever since the early days of its founding. In fact, it was precisely this international character that drew the first Christian missionaries to Tabriz. One Episcopalian pastor puts it this way, quote, Tabriz is the most eligible point in Persia for commencing an effort at missionary education. It has been more frequently visited by foreigners than any other city in Persia and has been more affected by the introduction of European arts and manners. The problem was, however, that this same cosmopolitanism that drew missionaries to Tabriz also made their work there much harder than in other Persian cities. 
Tabriz was an incredibly, extremely religious city, but it was eclectically religious. Practically every major Middle Eastern religion had a foothold in Tabriz, including a wide variety of indigenous Christianities, Armenian, Assyrian, Nestorian, as well as a, a rapidly expanding Catholic parish, and then also a small but thriving Jewish community. Tabriz was a major center of Babism. It was a major center of Baha'ism, of Sheikhism, of Zoroastrianism, of Buddhism. Uh, of course, the majority religion in Tabriz was Shia Islam, although there was a significant um, Sunni uh, community there as well. Shiism, as many of you know, is the largest sect of Islam and the majority religion in Persia. The thing is, is that it's not just that this sort of multi-religious landscape that I'm describing made missionary claims uh, to having absolute truth difficult to sustain. It's that religion in Tabriz, and especially the majority religion, Shiism, has long been viewed as a form of protest, uh, as, a, as a vehicle for dissent, right, as a cause for action. Evangelical Christianity, however, certainly as it was preached by American missionaries in Persia, was the opposite. It was all about personal piety and individual salvation. I mean, obviously good works were important, but good works did not save your soul. Only Christ could do that. And the problem, not just for Baskerville, but for many missionaries in Tabriz, is that this kind of apolitical evangelical brand of Christianity with its emphasis on personal choice and individual salvation, it was just a wholly foreign concept in Persia, even among its Christians. Religion, as it was preached by American missionaries, was like a, a cloak that you could simply choose to wear or not. Don't like the cloak that you're wearing? Just take it off and exchange it for another one. But for the vast majority of Persians, and especially for Tabrizis, religion wasn't an individual choice. It was a, a communal identity. In Persia, Christian was an ethnicity, not a denomination. Or rather, I should say it was both, right? It was both an, an ethnicity and a denomination because they were considered one and the same thing. Religion was less about the things that you believed and more a matter of who you were, right? So how then could it possibly be divorced from politics as the American missionaries demanded? On the contrary, religion was politics. The true test of salvation for most Persians, no matter what their particular religious persuasion, was not the acceptance of, of one set of beliefs or another. The true test of salvation lay in the willingness to lay down your life for those beliefs. It's funny, when I read the recollections of those who, know, who knew um, Howard in Tabriz, I find little evidence that he was even remotely successful in converting anyone in his orbit uh, to his faith. His dearest friend, Hassan, his closest student, Sadek, the, they both remained faithful Muslims throughout his tenure there. But I think the important thing to understand is that in the end, it probably didn't matter. It, it really wouldn't have mattered how hard Baskerville tried to convert the Tabriz. In this city, in this country, nothing Baskerville could have said would have made that much of an impression. If he had any hope of reaching those whose souls he had come here to save, he would have to show his faith. He would have to put it into action for all to see. And on April 20th, 1908, 1909, I should say, pardon me, Howard Baskerville did just that. The story of Baskerville's final months in Tabriz uh, is one of unspeakable suffering. In March of 1909, the Shah's troops arrived on the outskirts of the city. 
The inhabitants of Tabriz were given a chance to surrender by laying down their arms and handing over all the, the revolutionaries to be tried for treason. The city, of course, refused to do that. And so in response, the Shah's army laid siege to the city, closing all roads leading into and out of Tabriz, cutting off all supplies, and then just simply waiting for the inhabitants to starve to death. And it was at this point that Baskerville could really no longer ignore what was taking place around him. He uh, one day went to his students in the middle of class and he said to them, quote, I can no longer watch calmly from a classroom window, the starving inhabitants of this city who are fighting for their rights. He, for his students made a direct comparison between their fight against the Shah and the American Revolution, which he had learned so much about. I hate war he said, but then he went on to explain that war could be justified in furtherance of a greater good. And in this case, the protection of the city and the cause of constitutional liberty was that greater good. And what's more, as both a Christian and an American, he was ready to die for those causes. And when he finished speaking, his students erupted in cheers of long live Baskerville. After he gave this speech, Samuel Wilson, the principal of the school, obviously upset by the speech, um, came to Baskerville and insisted that he denounce his revolutionary activities. You are not one of these people, Wilson told him. Baskerville's famous reply to Wilson has been memorialized and memorized by generations of Iranians, myself included. He said, quote, the only difference between me and these people is the city of my birth. And that is not a big difference. The only difference between me and these people is the place of my birth. And that is not a big difference. And with that, Baskerville resigned from his missionary post. He resigned from his teaching duties at the school. He literally handed over his American passport and he fully joined the insurgency. By April, the city of Tabriz was on the verge of starvation. It had all but exhausted its medical supplies. Many of the city's inhabitants were forced to feed on dirt and grass. Children were dying. The stench of death was difficult to bear. And so it was then that Baskerville decided to try to break through the siege lines and collect food um, from a nearby village. On April 20th, 1909, at the break of dawn, Baskerville set out with um, a handful of his students, maybe like 10, 10 or 11 students. And as they approached the edge of Tabriz, a single bullet from one of the Shah's snipers pierced his heart. The publicity that resulted over his death which was reported in every newspaper in Britain and the United States, ultimately pressured the Shah to break the siege over the city. The memory of Baskerville's sacrifice sp spurred the revolutionaries in Tabriz to take the momentum and march to Tehran, where they ultimately deposed the Shah and forced the signing of a new constitution and the rebuilding of the parliament, which the Shah's Russian trained troops had destroyed with the parliamentarians still inside. In Tabriz, there was a huge memorial that took place for Baskerville. His flower-strewn coffin was taken through the streets. Tens of thousands came out to mourn the American who laid down his life for the cause of freedom in Iran. When the new parliament was finally reconvened, the first act was a speech of tribute to the memory of Howard Coughlin Baskerville. To this day, a bust of him cast in bronze is displayed in the Constitution House in Tabriz. Now this overview, of course, is just a glimpse into the brief life of Howard Baskerville. It doesn't cover, obviously, the events of the Constitutional Revolution itself, its prelude or its aftermath, nor does it make any firm judgment on the efficacy of Baskerville's actions. All I'm really interested in right now in discussing is why he did, why he what he did, why he died um, fighting in somebody else's civil war. And the answer to me is as solid as the marble sarcophagus in which Baskerville remains today in Tabriz. 
Howard Baskerville gave his life for democracy in Iran because as an American and as a Christian, he could not do otherwise. Thanks everyone. Us up there and uh, let's have a little uh, conversation. I'm sure there's lots of questions that you guys have about what I said or about other aspects of Baskerville's life in the constitutional revolution. I'm happy to talk about any of those things. Thank you very much, Reza. I think uh, it's quite a feat to cover so many events and years all in the whole age group of Baskerville, <laughs> young men, right? But you did a fantastic job. So I learned so much about it. And I think it is so important to place these developments in the right historical context, because if there is anything complicated in Iran is the inability to describe the events and developments in Iran within that period of historical context. And frequently scholars of Iran, historians of Iran, we have a tendency to kind of draw conclusions with a particular context for a broader conclusions and revisionism of history. And I think I like the way you summarized Baskerville's motives really having a lot to do with his thinking and his conviction. And whether he was in Afghanistan or Persia, he probably would have done the same because of his conviction. So it's just, that is the geography. So I think uh, we benefited a lot from this lecture. So your book is scheduled to come out in September, 2000. 22. 22. And we are hoping to have you in person for a book discussion in more detail then. That would be wonderful. Definitely. So let's go to math. And we got a lot of questions, a lot of comments as usual. So we will try to address them as they have come in. So go ahead, Matt. Yeah, thank you. Um, it was a wonderful lecture, um, framing a Baskerville that I haven't really encountered in um, the secondary literature, which as you mentioned, you can probably read in a morning. Um, so it was a um, kind of a wonderfully refreshing um, take on the subject and the individual. Um, we have some great questions. Um, one uh, asks about kind of Woodrow Wilson and by extension Baskerville, and it's about Baskerville's views on women. Do we have any records uh, about Baskerville's views on, let's say, the women's suffrage movement um, or even reflections on um, kind of the Jim Crow era, I would add, in the United States? Does he talk about this? Does he kind of reflect yeah. on American problems. Well, let's, and, let's, let's start with the Jim Crow era. I mean, again, I think sometimes uh, when we talk about Baskerville's mentor, Woodrow Wilson, who again, you cannot say the name Woodrow Wilson without saying unrepentant racist afterwards. I mean, he was a, a truly, he was a remarkable man who believed in, uh, you know, the cause of liberty for all men all over the world, except Blacks in America. I mean, that was, it was as clear as day for him, except for Blacks in America, as far as he was concerned. Um, so then the question becomes, well, you know, Baskerville was so affected by Woodrow Wilson, you know, I mean, his political awakening came as a result of the years that he spent being mentored one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, by Woodrow Wilson. Was he, did he share in Wilson's racism? Well, look, the truth is that we don't know. I mean, a biographer can't really look into the soul of his subject. But what we can say is that there is no evidence whatsoever that nothing ever written about him, nothing that he himself ever left behind or said, indicated in any way, shape or form that he shared Wilson's overt racism. Nevertheless, he was a white man, a white man of privilege at Princeton, a school that deliberately did not allow any black people. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the beginning of the 20th century. <laughs> so uh, it's very likely the truth is, is that he probably never thought about it, right? It didn't, uh, it didn't affect him, didn't occur to him. He didn't care, you know? Um, and that might be rude and crude to say, but it, you know, it's certainly better and, and more, I think in the context of the time, than uh, what we have of Woodrow Wilson and, and other sort of, you know, of these sort of clear racist views. With regard to women, 
Uh, we don't have a lot of, to say about his role, uh, his ideas about women in America, but one thing that people don't know about was that the vast majority of missionaries, American missionaries in Persia were women. Four times as many women served as missionaries in Persia as men. Uh, and in fact, missionary women in the 20th century, and this has a lot to do with the, the Second Great Awakening, which kind of gave birth to this evangelical missionary enterprise, um, was also, perhaps ironically, uh, a, a women's liberation movement within the Christian church. And women flocked to missionary work um, as a way of... Um, well, taking the kind of leadership roles in the church that they weren't allowed to do um, at, at home. So he was surrounded by women. In Iran, or in Persia, I should say at the time, um, he also seemed to have had a fairly kind of progressive attitude. Um, you know, he famously gave tennis lessons and horse riding lessons to his students, but what we know for a fact is he gave them equally to the women and the men, uh, the female and the male students. Um, and he also had a very tight knit group of students that he he kind of you know became the Woodrow Wilson of, of the American Memorial School. He had a group of students that kind of followed him around everywhere that he went. He's extraordinarily popular as a teacher. Um, and there is uh, ample evidence that there were female students among that group as well. So all we can really do is talk about his actions because he himself really never wrote anything. Um, you know, his views about race or about uh, feminism um, are, have been lost to history. But, but I think we can make some firm judgments based on the things that he did. I guess it's a good time to ask this question. Um, it, it was on my mind as well, but um, um, we're kind of wondering how you managed to get so much material on Baskerville to, to write a whole book. What, were there uh, new sources that you um, kind of uncovered that previous writers um, haven't? Did you maybe gain access to Iranian sources or family private collections or something that uh, perhaps we uh, haven't known about in the past? I guess so the question is about the sources and if yeah. there's anything, you know, kind of really new that you've, you're using. Yeah, the vast majority of the sources that that um, Esan and I, uh, my research partner and I, have been using are Persian and Russian sources. Obviously, as you can imagine, Baskerville was a man who was, well, you know, he was referred to as the Lafayette of, of Iran. I mean, uh, there was a, a lot that was written about him in the Persian sources. Interestingly, not just the historical sources, but also um, fictional sources. There are some half a dozen novels uh, written in Persian uh, about Howard Baskerville, historical novels that are just absolutely fascinating and that provided um, us with a lot of color, you know, as we were kind of recreating the world um, in which he lived. The Russian sources are also incredibly important about giving us a sense of the world that he lived in. You know, I, I made this comment earlier about how writing this this biography has reminded me a lot of writing Jesus's biography. There again, you have someone about whom we know very little, right? We have a, a tiny handful of, of firm facts that we can rely on when it comes to both of these men. But again, as is the case with Jesus, we know a lot about the world in which he lived, the politics, the social, the economic circumstances of, you know, in, in the case of Jesus of his ministry, in the case of Baskerville of the, this year and a half that he spent in Tabriz. So the challenge of the biographer is essentially to take what little we know about the subject, place him firmly in all that we know about his context and allow the context to define um, him and who he is and, and what, what he did and how th what he did affected um, the world around him. Uh, so in a way, this biography of Howard Baskerville is just as much a biography of the constitutional revolution in Tabriz. I'm sorry, Bachman, I think you're, you're muted. I, I can't hear anything. Yes, there are some questions are coming. Uh, 
about the current perception of Baskerville America. And in the past 40 years plus of mutual satanization that has been going on, this uh, story of Baskerville is one of the few bright spots of American-Iranian relation. So could you tell us a lot about how you think Baskerville and his symbolism and his image today among Iranians, as well as the little is known about America, how it could impact future friendship between Iranian people and American people? Yeah, so I would say that currently almost no one in Iran knows who Howard Baskerville was anymore, which is a shame. Really right up until the 50s, the 50s and the 60s, this was a story that all Iranians knew about. I knew, I knew the story of Howard Baskerville when I was uh, a, a kid in Iran. Um, there used to be elementary schools in Iran named after Howard Baskerville. Um, as many people know, his gravesite in Tabriz was a, 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 almost a kind of pilgrimage site. You know, the, like I said, the, the bust of him is still there in the Constitution House in Tabriz, as well as a, a giant, beautiful rug with his face on it that was a gift of the rug merchants um, in Tabriz. Um, I will say, however, that, that post-revolution, uh, post-79, uh, that memory of Howard Baskerville has more or less disintegrated. Very, very few people know anything about him. Almost nobody visits the grave anymore. Um, and frankly, that's a real shame because I think part of Baskerville's story, it's certainly the story that I'm trying to tell, is precisely um, the way in which um, this young man becomes a kind of symbol for the values um, that we as Americans and and, and uh, we, myself as Iranians, um, hold in common. I mean, until the 1979 revolution, the US and Iran were vital allies to each other. Iran was the, the most important country for America in the Middle East. Um, Iran and the United States had very close ties. Now, yes, those ties were based primarily on economic interest and military interest, it's true, but those are policy issues. What's more important is how that trickles down, you know, to the person to, uh, on, on the person to person level. And I think Baskerville kind of becomes symbolic of that. I, I don't know what's going to happen in Iran in the near future. I mean, I have hopes like all Iranians do, um, but I do think that part of my goal with this book um, and its translation into Persian is to provide both Americans and Iranians a framework, a model for the mutual friendship, the mutual values that could bring us together despite these coming upon four decades of um, animosity. Yes, thank you. So Matt, you got more questions, a lot of questions coming in, so. Any of questions. Um, do we have a sense as to whether or not Baskerville is remembered more among, um, you know, kind of the, the Iranian Shia community, um, among Assyrian Christians or Armenian Christians? Is there kind of variation between how different groups of Iranians think about Baskerville? I ask this question because we have a lot of great questions about the Christian community, Baskerville's relationship to it uh, in Iran, kind of various views of Baskerville um, uh, in Iran. So do we see variation or is there a kind of type of uh, Iranian figure that tended to gravitate to Baskerville more than others at the time? Well, so just to be clear, do you mean, you mean today or do you mean like during his, his time in the immediate aftermath? We could say at his time and then as his memory is being crafted yeah. over decades, maybe if there are principal players or groups in that process. Well, so what, what I will say this is that today, no, there really isn't any difference. I mean, I think Tabrizis are certainly more familiar with Baskerville um, because they're simply more familiar with the history of the constitutional revolution and the absolutely heroic, miraculous role that Tabriz played. Um, in uh, maintaining the, the constitution. I mean, there was, there was a brief while in which this constitution, which was enacted across the whole of Persia, um, existed 
really only in Tabriz. And actually there was a little while there, there was a, about a month or so in which it existed only in one neighborhood in Tabriz and nowhere else in Persia, the neighborhood of Amarchiz, the neighborhood of the people's commander, Satar Khan. Um, so no, it, it's just, unfortunately his memory has been completely lost regardless of your, your religion. At the time, however, what's, what's really fascinating, and maybe this will kind of answer some of the larger questions that people have about Christianity in Persia at the time and, and the Christian mission and what it was about. Um, the, the Christian mission in Persia was an old one. It, it actually began in Seir, um, so not in Tehran, not in Tabriz, um, uh, and in Urmia, long before it kind of settled in Tabriz. Tabriz remained the largest Christian mission, certainly during um, Baskerville's time. There were French missionaries there, there were British missionaries there, um, but the vast majority of the missionaries were American missionaries. Um, and, and Princeton was sort of the pipeline to the Tabriz um, mission. Samuel Graham Wilson himself was a Princeton graduate, the founder of the, of the American Memorial School there. Um, what's really fascinating <laughs> is that the, the but for the you know the first hundred years or so in which there was a missionary effort in Tabriz, a Christian missionary effort in Tabriz, it was very specifically focused on not on converting Muslims. That was deemed not just dangerous, uh, but it was also just deemed as impossible. Like that, it was a, it was a fool's errand to try to convert the Muslims. The primary focus of the Christian mission in Tabriz for decades before, Tab uh, before Baskerville arrived was to convert the other Christians, the Nestorian Christians, the Assyrian Christians, uh, you know, the, uh, those, those groups um, to American evangelical Christianity. That was why the missionaries went there. They were trained, they were told in no uncertain terms by the Presbyterian Board of Foreign Missions. I mean, this, is, this was very clear cut instructions that the missionaries were given. Do not preach to the Muslims. You are there solely to preach to what the church referred to, what the Presbyterian church referred to as, quote, the degenerate churches of the Middle East. That's how they referred to it, the degenerate churches of the Middle East. It was only with the sort of enormous success of that mission, the mission to convert non-American evangelical Christians in Persia, in Tabriz, to American evangelical Christianity, this kind of very private, personal, individual, salvific version of Christianity. It was only with the success of that, that a kind of phase two of the American mission there uh, began and that phase two was to convert the Muslims, the the, the Muslim uh, population. So when Baskerville arrived, that phase two was already well in place. The American Memorial School included Christians and Muslims. Um, the um, the the preaching, uh, you know, the, the 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 missionary activities were designed very specifically to bring Muslims into um, the, the, the cause of Christianity. So it was absolutely assumed that Baskerville's role as missionary would be to convert Muslims to Christianity, to ev evangelical Christianity. That was why he was there. He had Christian students, Armenian Christian students, um, but that was not his focus. His focus was the Muslims there. And as I say, there isn't that much written about it, but anything that is written indicates that he wasn't all that successful, actually, in doing that, which is why I think a lot of people sort of doubt whether he really was a missionary. I actually see, uh, uh, I, saw, I see this um, on the, in the Q&A by, by Human Estalami um, that, you know, he's not listed by the, the Presbyterian board as a missionary in their publications. But that's actually not exactly correct, but also... The, the, best, the best proof that we have is that we literally have his missionary application. We have his application not to the American Memorial School. We have his application to the, the Presbyterian Board of Foreign Missions. And in fact, he, we have his letters that he wrote to the Reverend Robert Speer, the, the, the head of the Presbyterian Foreign Missions Board. 
um, saying that he wants to be a missionary. This is what he's been training for all of his life and that he is ready to put aside, as I quoted, all other duties expected of him uh, and to promote the bringing of souls to Christ as his chief duty. So there is really, I know that there's still some kind of, you know, question or debate out there. I don't know why there is. There is no doubt, no question that Baskerville went to Persia as a missionary. That was his job. Teaching was part of that missionary job. There were a lot of missionaries at the American Memorial School. That's right. Yeah, that's a, uh... Yes, go ahead. So it is true that a lot of our kind of, it's a complicated story because as you mentioned, being a Christian, being a constitutionalist, pro-constitution, Wilsonian, Baskerville really brings that eclectic individual that even today we find among many Iranians who view their country in yeah. many ways, whether they view it as a hill of Virginia societies of made up of different ethnicities, right? And if you're from Tabriz, automatically they identify you as Azerbaijani. So we Iranians also ask a lot of those complicated questions. And I think one question that really comes about is, uh, at, I think several panel, uh, audience members have asked, John Lindbergh, one of our board members, former um, uh, diplomat in Iran has asked this question, the conventional wisdom is that the American missionaries were converting not Muslims, but Iranian Christians. For Baskerville, did that missionary impulse connect to the activism of Armenians mm -hmm. in the constitutional movement? Right. Uh, yes, that is a conventional wisdom. And as I said, that was the primary purpose of the mission for the vast majority of its existence in Tabriz, but not by the time um, uh, Baskerville arrived. By the time Baskerville arrived, um, we have the documents here, I, I can quote them. Um, by the time Baskerville arrived, um, it was very clear that the purpose of the mission was to it, first, convert the Armenian Christians, right? Convert the Assyrian Christians, the Nestorians into evangelical Christianity. And then second, use them as the mouthpiece to then convert Muslims to Christianity. Um, and then eventually it was just as simple as bringing, Christ, bringing Muslims into the memorial school, using the educational advantages of the school as a proselytizing um, vehicle, as I, as I mentioned in the, in the quote earlier. Mm -hmm. However, I'm very glad you brought up the Armenian Christians. There were, of course, a, a thriving, gigantic community of Armenian Christians in Tabriz. They had their very own ward. They had their own, you know, section of the city, um, the same section that the American Memorial School, by the way, also was in. Um, what's important to understand about the Armenian Christian community in Tabriz is that they were 100% on the side of the constitutional revolution. They fought alongside the revolutionaries in Tabriz. They were uh, uh, deeply um, involved in the revolution um, and they paid a terrible price for it um, during the, 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 the initial uh, attack on Tabriz um, at the uh, the summer of 1908, and then certainly during the siege of Tabriz in 1909, um, the Armenian Christians were deliberately targeted um, by the Shah's forces and by the tribes that he had kind of engaged um, as his kind of uh, forward force, if you will. Um, not not for their religion, although that's kind of what it, how it was uh, um, broadcasted, um, but specifically because they were passionate supporters of the revolutionary cause. Um, so this was a this was not a Muslim cause or a Shia cause. It was not a Persian cause. You know, people have mentioned that. Well, Tabriz was primarily Azeris and Turks. You're right, and Azeris and Turks and Persians fought side by side. Um, for the Constitution and for the revolution. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And I think uh, another important question that comes up is, uh, if you can notice, uh, there's a lot of uh, questions about why Baskerville's death did not pick up much notice in America, even though 
a couple of newspapers wrote about it. Washington Post wrote about it. Uh, yeah. London Times wrote about it, right? There was a London Times reporter at that time who wrote a lengthy piece about it. And yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think uh, it, even newspapers, as far as Hartford Current to St. Louis Dispatch, mm -hmm. I don't know if keep writing about it, but it, obviously it, the Princeton Princeton University papers were wrote about papers, it and had yeah, a memorial. Mm -hmm. what, why why did it not pick up? Do you think it had to do a lot with kind of a, an Orientalist thinking at that time that, well, he went to Persia and Persia had some kind of Oriental imaging in America, right? And so why, why would you, that's a couple of questions asking. Yeah. Um, his death get that attention? Well, I don't know, maybe, I, you know, it's, it's hard to say why. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe if there was Twitter back then, <laughs> uh, we would have hashtag Baskerville. Um, but the one thing that I do think is important that you bring up was the, yeah, the, the, the racist Orientalist view that dominated the, the White House mm -hmm. um, and that dominated British, the British Parliament. There's a lot to say about this topic, but one of the things that I think is most heartbreaking is the way in which the revolutionaries in Tabriz, from the beginning, just assumed that America would be on their side. They began, you know, in 1905, 1906, they assumed that the British would be on their side because, you know, they were fighting mostly against a Russian supported um, monarchy. And there was just an intense, intense hatred of Russia. And since Britain also hated Russia, the revolutionaries just assumed that Britain would be on their side in this war. But of course, in 1907, there was the Anglo-Russian agreement in which the, the British and the Russian kind of came to a detente. And after that, the British did not want to in any way inflame, you know, uh, Russian sentiments. And so wanted absolutely nothing to do with this revolution because it was so profoundly opposed um, by the Russians. I want to be as clear about this as, as possible. The reason that the revolution failed is not because of the Shah or because of the revolutionaries. The revolution, the constitutional revolution of 1905 failed because of the Russians. The Russians made sure that it, it failed. They are the, the Russians were the ones who bombarded the parliament building and destroyed it while the parliamentarians were inside. The Russians were the ones who trained the Cossack forces uh, that went around pillaging the constitutional houses. The Russians were the ones who armed the, the troops that besieged Tabriz and the Russians were the ones who ultimately occupied uh, Tabriz. So this was, this was as much a fight against the Shah as it was a fight against the Russians. Um, the reason the British didn't join was had to do with, as I say, these the foreign policy decisions, but also because of very rank um, anti-Muslim and anti-Persian sentiments in the British parliament, mm -hmm. the parliamentarian in the debate over whether Britain should have a role in the revolution very famously said that uh, the Persians don't know whether constitution is something to eat or something to wear. And when they discovered it was neither of those things, when they discover it is neither of those things, they will lose interest. I mean, that was the view of the British Parliament, you know. Uh, and in America was not much better. The State Department very specifically forbid all diplomats and then also more specifically all missionaries in Iran. Uh, it forbid them from having anything to do with the revolution. That's by the way why Baskerville had to turn in his passport. Um, when William Doty said to him, Just, you are forbidden to do what you're doing. The State Department has said, you cannot do this. And Baskerville said, okay, well then here's my passport. Then I'm, I'm not an American anymore because this is what it means to be American. Um, the same kind of, you know, uh, Orientalist anti-Islamic views pervaded uh, the State Department. The State Department issued a memo, I think once, uh, I'll get this, I'll get the quote incorrect. I have it somewhere, but the quote is something like, History has shown that no country run by Muslims could ever function as a democracy. And so this revolution is bound to fail. And so therefore America will have no role to play in it. Um, that was official American foreign policy. 
So maybe that had something to do with the fact that this was a story that that the State Department did not want Americans to know. The American who, despite <laughs> clear instructions not to do this, did it um, and fought for something that the official American policy was, that it was absurd, that it was ridiculous. Democracy in Persia, that's absurd. Mm. So that, that, I think that had a lot to do with it. Yeah. There was other questions regarding how his memory, his memory has survived different revolutions inside Iran, from the uh, rise of Reza Shah to Mossadegh's coup, past that, we come into the Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi, and the, finally the revolution. Somehow, the 50th anniversary, if I recall, of his memorial service in 1959, there was a lot of tribute to Baskerville. But even during the good times of relationship between US and Iran, it seems like the uh, both both governments were not interested to talk about him much. Yeah, is that yeah. is that a good reading? Mom? No, I think I think that is. I mean, look, the problem with Howard Baskerville is that his actions don't fit very neatly in anyone's particular narrative. I mean, you mentioned Reza Shah, uh, who did bring down the the despised Hajar dynasty that yeah. this revolution was fighting for in the first place. And so in many ways you would think, well, Reza Shah would have you know, some common cause um, with Howard Baskerville, except that Reza Shah was a member of the Cossack Brigade, the brigade that was the villains you know, in, this, in, in, the, in the fight of, uh, in Baskerville's story, right? I mean, the Cossack Brigade is the villain in that story. Um, certainly during the 53 revolution, the Mossadegh revolution, the, a lot of the conversations around uh, indigenous democracy and nationalism and the constitution and the building of a true parliament and, and you know, the, the idea of a constitutional monarchy, all of those things that were so much a part of what led to the constitutional revolution in 1905, those conversations unquestionably um, inserted Baskerville into the equation, and which is why 59 with the downfall of that revolution and the dreaded Shah back in his throne. Uh, and 59 was a kind of ideal time to celebrate that 50th anniversary of his death, except that in the 53 revolution, the Americans were the villains. They're the ones who, who stopped that revolution. They're the ones who put the Shah forcibly back on his throne. They're the ones who you know, with a suitcase of $100,000, essentially manufactured a fake counter-revolution um, and, and, and pulled Mossadegh, you know, out of power. So then it became very complicated. At, at the same time, you want to celebrate Baskerville and you want to celebrate the cause of democracy and you want to, you know, uh, oppose the Shah and Baskerville be becomes a very good vehicle for that, except that he's American and we hate the Americans right now for what they just did. And then obviously in 1979, that's a very complicated situation. You have this, you know, multifaceted revolution of communists and Marxists and uh, clerics and intellectuals and the middle class and the poor and women and men. And in that kind of heterogeneous uh, movement, it becomes very difficult to find a singular symbol that can kind of unite everyone. And again, anti-Americanism is a big part of it as well. So I don't know. I mean, I feel like I mean, in some ways mm -hmm. we're, we, we've, I know it's 100 and, 100 and what, to, to what is it, 12 years, 112 years since he died, that I feel like, okay, well, maybe now, maybe it's time. But I think also people just on either side of the of the aisle don't really know who this person is anymore. Nice. And the hope is that by reviving this story, um, that he can finally become a kind of symbol, a kind of model that will allow, after all of this time, some kind of, um, you know, intersection between the Persian and the American people. Maybe not the governments, but at least the people. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think uh, one of our friends, uh, Stephen Baskerville, 
asks the question, didn't former President Khatami visit the grave a few years ago? Yes, in fact, he's not the only politician um, to have done so. Um, you know, there's still, there's still a lot of, there was a, 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 a group that went just, I think, I wanna say 2009, I think it was. Yeah, so that was the 100 year anniversary. There was a, a group of, of Persians, um, diplomats, uh, people in the government who, who went to the grave. A lot of Americans to this day, you know, when they visit Iran, certainly when they visit Tabriz, they stop at the, at the grave site. Um, so, you know, certainly I think with the older generation, there's still this memory of this man. I think what's truly unfortunate, however, is that the young in Iran, yes. of course, we're talking about three quarters of the population. So that's, you know, everyone, uh, those born after the revolution have never heard of Howard Baskerville. They've never, they've never heard the story. They don't know anything about this. They probably haven't even heard the story, honestly, uh, of the constitutional revolution, um, let alone you know, the role of this young American Christian missionary in it. Yeah, this is why it's so important to translate that book into Persian. Yes. And we are going to work together with the Baskerville Institute to make sure that a timely translation of that book in Persian is made available to that Iranian audience. Uh, the irony is that the young Iranian population is very pro-American, if I could put it in a very general term, whereas in this country, the public has gotten adjusted to that mutual Satanization is very anti iranian So maybe a discussion of Baskerville can bridge a little bit the two young generation of post-revolution. So the final comments, we go to Matt, who would, we've used much of your time, Reza, so we will have one more, couple of more questions. And uh, I just wanna make sure that the audience is aware that we are recording the session. We will make the recording available to everyone. And uh, we will, to have your email list and Reza has kindly offered to provide signed copies of his book to our constituent and network here. Yes. So very pleased with that. So uh, I'd be delighted. Yes, go ahead, Matt. We can finalize some of the final con con uh, questions for Reza. Yeah, I think we got 10 minutes left, so plenty yes. of time. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to pick up on this question of uh, Baskerville's image almost less in Iran, but in the U.S. Um, when I think about Howard Baskerville, when I read some of these questions, I think of kind of, will the real Howard Baskerville please stand up? You know, there are so many different Howard Baskervilles, right? Um, you kind of gave the Baskerville as an American Protestant evangelical, and you you know, kind of in your argument refuted the kind of naive American kind of Gulliver type argument. Um, but there's this kind of other possibility that some have touched on, which is uh, certainly prior to the revolution, especially since Baskerville was so useful to Pahlavi state builders, it's possible that revolutionaries would have seen Baskerville as kind of a meddling American who is kind of unnecessarily involved in Iran's internal affairs. And uh, another question uh, frames it like this, that kind of you position Baskerville as a kind of American nation builder, maybe one of Kennedy's team, Johnson's team in the 1960s, or perhaps, um, you know, one of the um, architects of the Afghanistan or Iraq war after 9-11, uh, a kind of modernizing nation builder. Mm -hmm. um, so how would we refute this notion of Baskerville as a foreign meddler, uh, kind of um, modernizer who kind of has it all wrong? Um, well, look, I think what we can rely on are the statements by um, his fellow Persian revolutionaries in Tabriz. Now, one can say, okay, yeah, but all of that stuff was written after his death, you know? So can we really rely on, on this as the true sentiment behind them? I get that, but when you look at probably the most significant revolutionary uh, in, the, in the constitutional revolution, certainly the most significant revolutionary in Tabriz, and that's Satar Khan. Um, Satar and Howard knew each other. They actually knew each other fairly well. Um, uh, they had a number of, of meetings, um, certainly, 
Hassan Sharif Sadeh, who was half Baskerville's best friend um, and was an orator and a leader of the revolution, was someone who brought Baskerville into some of the inner sanctum uh, of the, the revolutionary movement, including into the secret center, the, the sort of, um, so, so in Tabriz, there's the Anjaman, there's the council, right? The revolutionary council that acts as the sort of public government. And then there's this thing called the, the secret society, which is the, the sort of more, a little bit more radical, um, younger revolutionaries who come together to, to talk more philosophically about what, what we're gonna do here in the new Persia, et cetera. And, and Baskerville, you know, because of Sherry Sade was a part of those conversations, an outsider, but a part of those conversations nonetheless. Um, there is some evidence that Sattar did view Howard as kind of a naive American. Um, there is some criticism that Sattar has about Baskerville's decision to create a militia from his students. Um, and I don't want to get to, uh, oh, those, just very quickly, the women, women and the thing. Just so everyone understands, women were part of the revolution. They, they literally cut their hair, put on uniforms, picked up rifles, and fought shoulder to shoulder uh, under Sattar's command and by Sattar's order uh, with men. And they died on the battlefield along with the men. So when I say, you know, uh, the, his men, I, I, I shouldn't say that, his fighters is what I should say. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, what Baskerville did was he kind of took the, the training of his students into his own hands. Um, and he did so comically. Uh, by by reading um, the Encyclopedia Britannica, <laughs> this is not this is a true story, true story. Uh, I mean, obviously, he knows nothing about military uh, matters uh, at all, um, and so he does what any kind of you know intellectual would do. <laughs> he finds an Encyclopedia Britannica. He literally looks up marching. Uh, he looks up bomb making. He learns how to make improvised explosive devices for his militia by reading the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, and he, he drills his students every morning, right? He's out there drilling his students in military techniques. Now, understand that Sattar is a guerrilla fighting a guerrilla war. <laughs> and so there is some commentary that I think is trustworthy that Sattar saw Baskerville as kind of a useful tool, mm -hmm. right? That he saw, he was like, he's like, look, it's an American and a Christian and he's joining this revolution. That's good PR. Is he going to actually be helpful with this like marching? We're not marching. <laughs> we're like, we're, we're fighting a guerrilla war here. Nobody is marching anywhere, uh, but fine. It's fine. He's doing his thing. He's keeping busy. And there's some very interesting um, conversations that I get to in the book about whether when Baskerville volunteers for this mission with his students to break the siege, whether Sattar thought to himself, this kid's gonna die and that's good. Mm -hmm. um, there is, I think, ample evidence that Sattar thought to himself, oh my God, this, this is a terrible idea, uh, but yes, go, go do it. Um, turns out Sattar was right, by the way. It was unquestionably Baskerville's death and the negative press that it brought to the Shah that forced him, it was the Russians actually, who forced him to stop the siege mm -hmm. and to release Tabriz. The releasing of Tabriz allowed Sattar to grab his army and march to Tehran and bring the Shah down from his throne. So. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that Baskerville's death led to the success of the revolution, at least in the short term. Yeah. Um, the larger question is, you know, did Sattar's view of Baskerville, was that shared by other Persians and other revolutionaries? Hard to say. Um, but again, I think that post his sacrifice, whatever they thought about him beforehand, whether they thought about him as 
a useful tool or naive or an American who's getting into something he doesn't know anything about, the fact that he was willing to do, to give what in Shiism is the greatest sign of piety, the attempt to lay down your life in the name of your community, right? This was literally walking in the footsteps of Hussein at Karbala. Yes. This, is, this is what he did. That, any view that they had about Baskerville be, before that evaporated. Mm. And he became a martyr. He became a martyr to the cause and a, and a prominent one and a, and, and a well-respected one. So I do think it's difficult to kind of make judgments about how they thought about Baskerville because all those judgments are post-death. And post-death, whatever criticisms they may have had about Baskerville was replaced with admiration and for, for his uh, willingness to sacrifice himself. He, I want to be clear. I know I have one minute left. I want to be clear about this. Baskerville understood clearly that it was a suicide mission. He's not going to break this siege with 10 students. That's not happening, you know? There are thousands of government troops encircling this city. It wasn't going to work. Everyone knew it wasn't going to work. Baskerville knew it wasn't going to work. And so there isn't any other way to think about this except as self-sacrifice. And that's certainly how the revolutionaries in Tabriz thought about it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so we will end with this final question from another colleague that has asked, what do you think are the chances that civil society in both nations can play a more significant role in changing the state of relations between the two countries. Well, I don't, you know, at, at, the, at the risk of getting a little too political here, nearly, at, especially at the end, I think that the, the sort of future that we are hoping for mm -hmm. is inevitable. That the demographic, cultural, and economic shifts that are irreversible in Iran are um, inevitably leading towards a, um, an outcome that we all know, that we all know it's coming. You know who else knows it's coming? The government in Iran knows it's coming. Um, that, in fact, in many ways explains a lot of the behavior of um, the government in Tehran. When you know that it's all about to come crumbling down, uh, that's when you act the way that they're acting. Um, I do think that with the new Biden administration and an attempt to return to the rational foreign policy, which is engagement and an opening up of Iran, as opposed to 40 years of a failed policy. I mean, look, I honestly, I don't care whether you're a Republican or Democrat, whether you're a hawk or a dove, I really don't care about any of those things. If you do the same thing for 40 years and you never get the result that you are going for, do something else. It's not complicated. Do something different. Otherwise, you're an idiot. <laughs> and we now have somebody who's not an idiot uh, in the presidency. And I think that should he move forward with the Obama administration's um, larger goals that opening up the country instead of closing it down is the only answer to uh, creating the kind of Iran that we all hope that we can, we can have. Um, I think that's the path forward. So I, I'm actually quite, quite optimistic about the future right now. Well, thank you so much for that optimistic message. That is really one of our primary mission in this institute to project a positive message between Iran and America. And you did so much for us today with that fantastic presentation, surprising everyone how much one can do with really diligent research. But I think you have your heart in this subject. There is something I that I noticed that is very different from your previous book, that in this book, I think there is some heart in it and you, as an Iranian American and so forth, you do see some attachment to the subject. Yeah, I think this is the most important book I've ever written. And it feels that way. Um, and um, and hopefully it will be received that way. Yeah, and we, we're looking forward to have you 
for the book and we want to encourage you to start writing faster so we can get to <laughs> earlier so uh and also we were told that it is also a film uh yes. could be coming could you tell us a little bit about the film part of this uh, uh i can tell you doing? very 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 briefly that yeah. the film rights to the book um have been uh acquired by a um, studio. I am going to be writing um, that screenplay, um, but uh, I can't I can't really think about it until the book itself is done. So um, hopefully I'll finish the book by the end of this summer yes. and finish all the edits. And then early, the plan is by early next week to, to dive headfirst into uh, the film version of this. And, you know, if you know the story, I mean, it, it's it's cinematic. It oh. is a cinematic story. Absolutely, absolutely. And what a wonderful way of reaching out to the American public about it by a yes. film. Yes, yes. You know. We watch movies. We don't read books in America. We don't read books. And, uh, and we are so happy you have that entertainment side and uh, that mixture. So I want to, on behalf of the Institute, Reza John, on behalf of everyone who attended, we are a large group of audience and we have all the questions and everything will be in touch. We will make sure they will get their books signed and all that. And we will make sure that you will coming back again to talk more in detail when the book comes out. And we really want to thank you for giving the time and this uh, presentation to us, Matt. Thank you. And let me just also say thank you to everyone and thank you for the Baskerville Institute and, and a special thanks um, to Stephen Baskerville. And I think there's some other members of the Baskerville family who have joined and I'm absolutely um, just, you know, uh, I, I can't thank you all enough for, um, you know, your ancestor and yeah. what he has meant to me and to, to so many people. And all I can try to do is honor him the best way I can with this book. Thank you so much and uh, have a wonderful weekend. And I'm sure we'll be in touch and please let us know about your latest publications, anything that comes out resident. Thank you so thank much. And thank, thank you everyone for attending. And thank again, you. we had so many students from different universities, believe it from University of Maine, we had students in your talk. So this was truly a national presentation. Good. Thank you so much.